Welcome to our podcast episode on diagnostic, prognostic, and predictive biomarkers for the treatment of endometrial cancer. I am your host, Anna Christofides. Our guests for this episode are Dr. Jessica McAlpin, a gynecologic oncologist and division head in the Division of Gynecologic Oncology at the University of British Columbia, and also Dr. Mary Kinlock, a gynecologic pathologist and division head of pathology and laboratory medicine at the University of Saskatchewan. Hope you enjoy it. So thanks so much, Dr. McAlpin and Dr. Kinlock, for joining us today to discuss diagnostic and prognostic markers for the treatment of endometrial cancer. Welcome. Thanks very much. Well, I think it's a really, really exciting transformational time in endometrial cancer in this disease site. Um, We've gone from a system of very poorly reproducible histomorphology, we're looking under the microscope, has made it difficult to categorize these tumors and inconsistent, to a really much more subjective, um, I mean, objective and much more reproducible era of using genomic features, initially from the Cancer Genome Atlas and quite in-depth genomic characterization, and then sort of morphed to much more pragmatic, low-cost, easy-to-do-in-any pathology lab series of tests that reproducibly categorize four molecular subtypes. So we have now um, identified these prognostic molecular subgroups for um, one polymerase epsilon mutated is a very highly favorable outcome group. Uh, about 10% of endometrial cancers, uh, excellent, excellent outcomes. And then we have a mismatch repair deficient group. Um, so missing um, or an abnormality within mismatch repair, a type of DNA repair mechanism. We have a P53 abnormal group uh, with really poor outcomes, very like high-grade serous ovarian cancers or basal-like breast cancers. And then a sort of um, not defined by any of those feature groups, given the name NSMP or no specific molecular profile, which actually encompasses about half of cancer. So these four prognostic, highly reproducible groups have really transformed how we categorize these tumors and given us a new framework. And I think it really helped change things. The WHO, which is sort of the pathology guide globally, adopted these in September of 2020. And subsequent to that, um, there's been clinical guideline changes as well to help you know people like myself who are clinicians to, to try and better categorize these patients and figure out how to manage them. That's great that there's been so much progress. Really glad to hear that. And so just you know, along those lines, is there a sort of biomarker type of testing algorithm that can be followed for endometrial cancer patients? I think we'll probably get to talk about this today. I think it's not quite the same everywhere, but what is recommended by the WHO is to obtain these tests. In British Columbia, for example, we've had routine testing for mismatch repair since 2019, then routine testing for P53 recommended since 2021, and in 2022 in BC and in lots of parts of Canada, POLI, that last um, and other sequencing test was approved. So it's actually now impacting how we manage patients day to day. So in Canada, we're in a system where sometimes it's tough to manage every endometrial cancer patient in a tertiary cancer center. Some of these patients are managed in a community, traditionally low grade, well, that is grade one cancers were managed maybe by a general gynecologist because we thought hysterectomy alone was enough to treat them. But we're now actually using this molecular testing to help direct triage to a cancer center versus the community. And that is on a biopsy. And the cool thing about classification is you can actually do it on a biopsy because you have great antigen preservation from a curatage or a a biopsy specimen in clinic. Um, And you can do DNA extraction for sequencing. So on a biopsy, we do estrogen receptor status, the mismatch repair, IHC status that we talked about, and P53 status by immunohistochemistry. And for those patients who are low grade, that is grade one or two, and who are um, estrogen receptor positive, mismatch repair proficient, and P53 wild type, we say they can be managed in the community. And then all other patients should be managed at a cancer center and have nodal assessment and otherwise. And, And that's not unique to BC. I think there's centers in the UK triaging in that way and in Australia as well. 
The other sort of obvious one that comes, and, and indeed where all the work was done in working on molecular classification up to date, has been testing on the hysterectomy specimen. Whether it's done on biopsy or hysterectomy, there's hugely important features that help identify patients for certain therapeutics. So mismatch repair deficiency in any solid tumor has been an indication for FDA-approved immune checkpoint blockade, for example. So knowing that status is tremendously important for patients if they have advanced disease or in a recurrent setting. And we may see those therapies being pushed into to frontline even in earlier stage disease. There's also this kind of fun emerging new frontier where now that we've got the four molecular subtypes, we're adding testing within subtypes that helps stratify. And one example of that would be within P53 abnormal tumors, for example, where these are patients that I've hinted at have a much higher rate of recurrence and we really need new treatment options. Well, about 20 to 25% of these patients might have HER2 overexpression or amplification, and they might be candidates for already approved drugs that we use, for example, in HER2 overexpressed breast cancer. Um, and those can be applied in those patients. Oh, well, that's great. And I know you've covered which were looked at reflexively, but what are some of the things that affect that, you know, specifically? Certainly, it had been historically a chance um, or a challenge with resources. I'll be interested in hearing Dr. Kinlock's perspective on this as well. But we, um, I think it takes a really good relationship with clinicians and pathologists. The pathologists have known since September of 2020 that these tests are recommended to be integrated. Clinicians know that these tests are integrated into treatment guidelines. They assign risk group, which help direct treatment. So in, in my opinion, it's not excusable to not have these data when you're trying to decide treatment for patients. And I think that the ESMO guidelines from 2022 really reflect that, where there isn't an option to risk stratify a patient without these molecular features. But yes, um, it comes down to, of course, asking your pathologist for this. And the pathologist, I think, can also incredibly drive change by providing this information and then clinicians have to learn to act on it. What do you think, Mary? What would you answer for this kind of question? Yeah, I would probably echo that and and liken it to something like if you were doing something like rowing with a team and your team is your pathologists and your gynae oncologists and maybe your genetic counselors. And if none of you are kind of pushing or rowing towards these new molecular markers, because I mean, while I take your moral argument, Jess, that we are all physicians and we should always be pushing for this, we're also humans and being a physician is a difficult job and nobody's really looking in on us and making sure that we're doing it. So we have to be driving that change from inside of the boat. So if you do have a very strong relationship with your gynae oncologist, your pathologist and your genetic counselors, and you're all saying together, we're going to row in this direction, then you're going to get somewhere. But you could easily just sit in that rowboat and <laughs> still do a classification system without having um, the, the molecular biomarkers, because if your clinical team is not demanding them and you don't have any personal moral compass driving you towards doing it, it really is like a lot of work. And yet you have to learn new things, which is hard for people sometimes. So it, it does take a lot to, and it can't be underestimated how much this has changed since 2013, when the first introduction of the TCGA for endometrial cancer came out. That's some great thoughts on this. And um, just wondering, you know, going back to, you know, which uh, tests are looked at reflexively versus not. So if they're not looked at reflexively, what patient criteria are really used for testing? Maybe Dr. Kinlock, you can start with that. So we've, we've had universal testing for MMR IHC since 2015. And that is really of the benefit of taking people that you have locally. So I, I'm in Saskatoon. I had the benefit of going to University of British Columbia, where Dr. McAlpin practices uh, in 2014, and where they were already doing universal MMR testing. And stopped up all the knowledge there for a year and reintroduced it back into Saskatoon in 2015. So everybody gets a a biomarker for MMR-IHC 
on their biopsy when they come in, regardless of how old they are or what their diagnosis is. And then we have just started to do a universal P53. As these things evolve, there's no right way or wrong way to put things into place. So we're just evolving all together. If it was one person doing it, then it's a lot easier to change things. But we have 26 pathologists here and about five of us do endometrial cancer work. And so you're working with a team of five to um, try and change practice. So on biopsy, you would get an MMR IHC and you would get a P53 as a universal testing. And we're slowly incorporating the estrogen receptor as Jess stated, because when I came into practice, that wasn't required on everyone and it wasn't part of the TCGA. So that's something new as well too. And then we go through that based on what type of treatment they're going to have from the other uh, light microscopy uh, parameters that we assess, like depth of invasion and lymphascular invasion, then we will decide whether or not to do the poly. And I think that that's mostly just because we haven't figured out how to incorporate it into our routine practice quite yet. Everybody's still new with it. Working with a gynae oncologist, we still want to discuss everything at rounds. Right now, we don't have any reimbursement barriers for us for poly. It's just getting comfortable with what we want to do with it. And things are evolving. I know that some places do poly routinely on all. Yeah, maybe we should try that. And like, maybe it will come in the next year. We just have to remain open into like evolving and like catching the wave with everyone. And how how is that being tested, the poly? Is it NGS or... It is. Um, it's, it's at our molecular lab, um, which is just across the river in Saskatoon at the University of Saskatchewan. And we do um, a next generation sequencing panel that's able to be done off of the biopsy tissue. And uh, we test for the 11 pathogenic variants of poly in the exonuclease domain. And then we have like some other prognostic markers on there that may or may not be used in the interpretation, most notably P53. So if we really had a difficult P53 IHC that we had to interpret, we we do have a backup with NGS. And, and usually what would happen is that if you're having difficulty interpreting the P53, it's because there's going to be something else that's disrupting the P53 as a passenger mutation. And that's usually going to be poly or MMR. Mutations. So, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's great. And so, what what are the differences between MMR and MSI testing, for example? Oh, well, they're testing two different things. So, in MMR IHC, you're testing protein expression, whereas in a microsatellite instability, you're using a PCR test to test the activity. So, what MSI, which was what was originally done with the TCGA is that those tumors were interrogated in many different ways, one of them being MSI testing. And what that does is looks at transcription uh, replications from, um, so as you unfold your DNA, replicate it, and, and go through those replication cycles to have daughter cells, there's certain areas of your DNA called microsatellites that are repeating areas of DNA. So if you can imagine something like A, 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 and you have six A's in this confirmed location, conserved location amongst everybody. And when you have a DNA polymerase and it is going through and transcribing six A's, it gets bored. It's like, was that five A's or was that six A's? And so sometimes the, at those locations, you're, you are at risk for the DNA polymerase to make an insertion loop and have seven A's or to make like a reduction and only have five A's. And so thankfully we have the mismatch repair complex that comes on behind the DNA polymerase and has the ability to take out the base pairs that we had inappropriately put in there and put the correct ones in to make sure that there's six A's at every replication cycle. So when you look between your tumor DNA and your 
normal DNA, which is what you have to do for microsatellite instability, then at those loci, you will see the same number of microsatellite replications for each time that you reproduce the cell. If it's microsatellite instable, then you don't have your mismatch repair complex. And so you're just getting different numbers for every time you replicate, and you're going to have different peaks along those PCR. So what we're doing in the IHC world, and that's what most places do, because it's available in two days and it's a cheap test, and we can integrate it within routine laboratory practice, is that you're looking for the fact, and we're going back to first principles of why we introduced this test, which was as a marker for people with hereditary cancer syndrome, Lynch syndrome, and that they didn't have protein expression because there was a gene mutation in the mismatch repair genes that made up the mismatch repair complex, which then went into the protein expression. So what we're actually looking for in IHC is the protein expression. So that won't tell you that you have a gene defect, but it does give you, it's more of a screening test. And then there's also times where you have, say, even if you have a gene defect or you have a um, mismatch repair deficiency, that you can still get a malformed protein. So you're still getting some protein expression, which is why we always need the MSI maybe as a companion test so that we can um, evaluate, okay, is this really just poor protein folding and expression or is there really a problem with the activity here? So we use them complementary in some forms. But I would say that almost everywhere uses the MMR IHC in Canada. That's great. And thanks so much for that explanation. That really helps me to, to visualize it a lot better. And so just bringing it back to Canada specifically, I'm, I'm curious, you know, of course, we're limited by what is approved by Health Canada and then what is funded provincially. So I'm wondering for Dr. McAlpin, if you can just fill us in on which biomarkers are really needed for specific treatments. Yeah, I mean, I think I echo everything Mary said that we really want to be working together and and working at full speed and motivation in that rowboat. But even if you could make a plug to at least do this much lower cost immunohistochemistry for mismatch repair and P53, I think you're incredibly ahead of uh, where we were a decade ago. And why is that? Well, P53 identifies, you know, five to 10% of low grade cancers that um, if they're abnormal are at a much higher risk of recurrence. We know that P53 abnormal tumors do better with chemotherapy and, and the chemotherapy plays an incredibly important role as well as additional testing that we talked about. So important to know, but mismatch repair has been hinted about. This is identifying a, a group that whether it's a germline or hereditary syndrome, um, or whether it's somatic or an epigenetic event that has given this individual the or their tumor this mismatch repair deficiency that's detected, it has provided an indication for one of the most exciting sort of new drugs in this era that is immune checkpoint blockade and and efficacy even in heavily pretreated patients and in really exciting aspects. So important to get that. And as well as, of course, important with the reflex um, genetic testing and to identify individuals with Lynch syndrome who then can be offered other screening techniques and and their first degree relatives. So those are sort of obvious, basic, conventional and targeted therapeutic options that are open to you. And some, some centers have real protocols and limits to when they can give drugs within their province. They're not going to, and I think appropriately so, you don't give agents across all endometrial cancers, but you give them to those individuals where that given treatment is is more likely to work based on the tumor biology. And these are simple tests that can be produced. Yeah. And I think that what we've seen, what definitely what we've seen in other disease sites, most notably in lung adenocarcinoma, where biomarkers also play a very important role in determining actionable mutations for precision chemotherapy is that these things start as very narrow focus. So you're, you're doing only the advanced stage patients. You're doing only patients that um, have these certain clinical parameters. And then they, it starts to broaden and it starts to expand as the research starts to expand. And as we have P53 
people that within the healthcare system that are slowly interrogating, moving the chains and advocating for their patients. And now what we're starting to see is that lung cancer biomarker testing is reflex for all patients, regardless of your stage, as long as you have something that kind of resembles an adenocarcinoma under the microscope. Again, we don't do any more. We used to do so much work to try and figure out if it was an adenocarcinoma or if it was a squamous cell carcinoma for those really ugly tumors using immunohistochemistry that were lineage specific stains. And all we were doing there is just wasting the tumor tissue. Like now we save it and send it for molecular because that's the important message that really matters. So I think that there's still room for a large evolution of biomarker testing in endometrial cancers. But I think that we're seeing the almost the natural evolution of it starting narrow, seeing the benefits of it, and then it's slowly opening up because it's very hard for healthcare centers uh, complex, large healthcare centers to see savings in one area that can be applied to funding in another area. So yeah, biomarker testing is more money up front, but I think that the savings and benefits to patients is exponential in the long run. That's great. And, and I wanted to ask both of you, are there other biomarkers that you test for that can really affect uh, your treatment algorithm and then also in, in the relapse setting, do you retest biomarkers upon disease progression, for example? Yeah, that's been an evolving field um, and is really exciting. I mean, I think we looked at it in the original pragmatic post-GCG era of molecular classification and hadn't seen changes, for example, in the very, very rare poly recurrences. They still tend to be immune rich and otherwise P53 abnormal. We've not seen changes. Some initial, there's a bit of discordance in the literature on mismatch repair deficient. There's been a couple of recent series that have shown that if you're mismatch repair deficient in primary tumor, it's unlikely to change in recurrence. But there seems to be an acquired change in some of the NSMP cases, that is a loss of that DNA repair proficiency that Dr. Kinlock described, so that someone who might become mismatch repair deficient, maybe around 9 to 10%. So it might be worth retesting MMR. That's simple and cheap to do that IHC. And that again, opens an opportunity to use IO therapy. Yeah, I think what we, again, the learnings are so broad here um, because we're still in the early stages of it is that a lot of the early MMR discordances for endometrial cancers were an area in which it was called subclonal loss. And so it was just, something that we didn't know a lot about where only some of the tumor lost its MMR features and we had such, or lost its MMR expression. We had such stringent guidelines that it had to be, it was a zero sum game. Like, so it was either 0% or it was considered proficient. And so going back on that, now we start to see that a lot of those discordances were probably subclonal due to MLH1 hypermethylation but definitely can see how that that NSMP group specifically can acquire something like an MMR deficiency. The the problem, like, and maybe Jess, you can comment on it, is that previously, like historically, if you had an imaging recurrence for a patient with endometrial cancer, you wouldn't always need biopsy material for that. But if that's if we're starting to see like where there might be a mismatch repair deficiency on recurrence and you would need that biomarker to get access to an immune checkpoint inhibitor, you would need to then go in and get a biopsy for that, which previously yeah. you may not have. Yeah. And some of the recent publications in GYO 18 are suggesting even some response, even in those that without mismatch repair deficiency. So it'll oh. depend on your center, whether you can access it. But yes, I would say, yeah, the simple answer is clinicians where we're, you know, grasping for really looking for more intelligent decision making around treatment for that individual is if um, if it was done a long time ago, as Mary's implying, and you're not sure about it, retest the primary. If you've got tissue accessible and can retest the recurrence, we often do because we are looking for other aspects or we're looking, you know, again, more in depth within that tumor within P53 abnormal, looking for 
HER2 overexpression, homologous recombination deficiency, other things that where there's drugs available, such as trastuzumab or PARP inhibitors, where we could do it. So I think, yeah, get the information and that's what will help provide more data for us to, you know, have more algorithm directed guidelines in the future. We need to get get more intelligent with this. And one of the things that I think that hasn't been explored, or I think that has the possibility in the next few years for exploration, is the combination of your mutational classification of your tumor combined with your surgical approach. Mm -hmm. And it's just really hard to get the numbers for that. But because like what Dr. McAlvin has shown in the last couple of years is that there is a wild amount of variation in surgical approach across Canada. And then how does that affect the story when you combine that with um, the molecular classification? Do you, do you think, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I, the easy thing is is predicting things like nodal involvement. Do I think the approach MIS versus open is a huge difference or like what we've seen in cervix where it makes a big negative impact to be MIS. I don't think we'll see that um, when appropriate techniques are used, but sure, it would be um, great to see. But I think the morbidity spared and all those things are important. But certainly it, it, it raises all these really interesting questions about who needs nodal dissection. Yes, the risk is high, but is it therapeutic? If it's not therapeutic, why are you doing nodes if you're going to treat all of them anyway? Risk of radiation lymphedema and things like that. It's it's um they're really good questions or why why do you need nodal dissection in polies if you're gonna de-escalate and they all do well. So there there are lots of really exciting things that I think we might have an opportunity to answer in the next in the next decade. So what are some of the um additional emerging biomarkers that you see coming in the future? Yeah, I think I've hinted at some. So I think again homologous recombination deficiency, um her two overexpression. The other big burgeoning one where we've got these huge drug trials that are really exciting combinations of IO with anti-angiogenics or within P53 abnormals data suggesting that anti-angiogenics like um, bevacizumab or lumbatinib can work well within P53 abnormal. Yeah. We need better biomarkers for those. Um, you need to be a bit more selective. Right now, often the indication for the combination is mismatch repair proficient but that's a huge <laughs> group. I think it's going to show that those are more effective within P53 abnormal, but I think we need biomarker selection within that diverse group and not only for who it works best in because they're toxic regimens and they're high cost, but also biomarkers for toxicity within um, those and who's going to have you know more negative sequela versus do quite well with it. And, and that's what I would like to, to see coming from these trials that are um, increasingly done and that we're waiting for the correlative work from. So, so yes, yeah, so I was going to ask you, Dr. McAlpin, like, so then if you could imagine the future being here today, what would you hypothesize the treatment algorithm might be based on these biomarkers? Yeah, I know it's great. It's nice having also Mary's perspective in this, the fact that cancers in other disease sites are getting all these testing. And as a shout out to International Women's Day yesterday, we just have to remember this sort of disproportionate less testing in, in some of these gynecologic tumors. So what I would like to see and what I think has a great opportunity to reduce some of that variation in, in practice and, and reduce the willy-nilly practices that sometimes we, we tend to follow is to have this objective testing done for every newly diagnosed endometrial cancer such that they get the molecular work that is needed, at least providing the IHC for P53 ER and mismatch repair is as stated, and for sure for poly if it makes a difference in treatment. Then within those, to be very selective of what testing is done. You don't need additional molecular testing within poly if it's got one of the 11 pathogenic mutations, because we've shown that that is an overriding feature that trumps path features, trumps molecular features. You do, and we're going to get more nuance in NSMP and within P53 abnormal that'll help you with treatment selection and even differences within the type of mismatch repair deficiency. And, and then you apply those additional tests in that group and, and try and refine further. So I, uh, to me, that's where we're, we're going. Um, and I hope would be provided to every individual who, who has this disease. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on this, Dr. Kinlock? And also just I know you hinted at some of the challenges, but 
you know, sort of delving into where, what are the barriers to doing these assays? Yeah, I think that there is probably structural barriers and then maybe individual barriers. And so always when you're introducing something new that would be a cost to the, like the lab is generally a cost sucker for the healthcare system. Like we cost the system money. It's not like in the States where you can bill the insurance company for every test that you can do. So, but when you look at it, we're about 4% of the total budget of the healthcare system. So considering that we provide about 80% of the, any sort of diagnostics that you would have on a patient, we think it's a good return on investment, but you always have to go through the, the process of trying to um, get the remuneration for what it is that you're doing. And we have some creative ways to do that in the lab. So if you're, if you were looking for an excuse not to do it, because for whatever reason, nobody is like, I mean, we have to be honest that in some places, nobody understands what we do. So there's really no one looking over your shoulder unless it's the gynae oncologist saying you have to bring this in. It's it's really the advocacy work of the pathologist. So sure, the reimbursement costs, once you get that hurdle through, then you have the individual hurdles of that you have a proficiency testing that needs to happen with the readout of these biomarkers. P53 has been around for a long time. And so you would think that we were really good at reading it, but there is evidence to show that there is variation and not always um, like with specifically with reporting out terminology that crosses over to the knowledge translation that we're trying to get at with the gynae oncologist. So what we wanna avoid doing is having gynae oncologists also needing a five-year pathology Royal College and pathologists needing to understand and have a five-year Royal College in gynae oncology. And we need to be able to talk to each other about what our needs are and communicate that through a written report in a way that can be digested and understood and then applied. And that is more difficult than you think. So once we get those hurdles, once we get the hurdles of the healthcare system behind us, then we have the individual hurdles of educating the pathologists and all getting on the same page there. That's definitely a huge challenge, but it sounds like (laughs) the way forward for sure. So I just wanted to um, ask Dr. McAlpin, do you have any sort of final thoughts that you want to leave us with and you as well, Dr. Kinlock? I think only just to talk with your pathologist and and engage it reach out to or encourage them to reach out to another center that are implementing molecular testing, um, both the clinician side and the pathology side, how it's working, what barriers they overcame, um, how did they make it happen in their center? Because I I can tell you it's it's really been transformational for our group and the knowledge translation within our community has been rapid and excited and engaged. I think if you if you build it, everyone's gonna come and gravitate and it can be really, really positive. But those first hurdles can be tough. Um yeah, what would you add, Mary? Was that yeah, I think it would be that um you can drop into the hazard that if you do this on a daily basis of just trying to introduce something new alone, that that's going to be really hard. So there has to be some protected time that you're taking to talk with the other people in your group and discuss this and what do you need and how can we move forward with it? Because you're going to go a lot further by working as a group together than if you're going to try and push for it alone. And it did, it just does take like set aside time at your rounds to discuss it. Cause otherwise you can just get into the trap of like days are busy. Nobody has additional time in their day if they're not planning for it. So I think that that's the most important thing. That's great. Did you want to add one more thing, Dr. McAlpin? We've talked a lot about how testing identifies actionable, targetable opportunities, but I guess I'd give one more plug too that um, as a clinician, we've really struggled with the fact that we know that we're probably over treating so many endometrial cancer patients and that, you know, poly testing has identified this subgroup with rare recurrences. Fantastic. Maybe that's six to 10% of endometrial cancers. But now with the work in NSMP tumors, there's 
this huge group of NSMP tumors, if they're estrogen receptor positive and low grade that are incredibly low risk of occurrence and also candidates for de-escalation. And reality is through, through testing, you might get half of all endometrial cancers that might be candidates for surgery alone, no, no toxic therapy. And gosh, if that doesn't motivate you, I'm not sure what would like, so I think we're, we're tired of feeling we're, we're over treating just like we're tired of not having better treatments. So sometimes that can help motivate maybe in your community as well. Some great, uh, great thoughts there. Thank you so much, both of you for joining me today. I know I feel as if we could talk for hours and hours and we would just only scratch the very immediate surface of all of this, you know, um, but it's, uh, it's really fascinating and it's nice to hear the passion you both have for it. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.